If you woke up chained to a pipe in a grungy bathroom with another man and were told that if you killed him, you'd be set free, but if you didn't, you and your family would die. What would you do? In this highly requested how to beat video, we'll follow Jigsaw's victims, see if we can make better decisions, and ultimately attempt to beat the traps in Saw. If you think you could do better, or if you have a movie request, let me know in the comments. If you want to stay prepared for all the other worst case scenarios movies can come up with, hit the like, notification bell, and subscribe button so you don't miss a beat. This video's sponsor is Raycon. Raycon's making a lot of noise in the electronics industry with their wireless earbuds. The company was co-founded by Ray J, and if you aren't familiar with him, here's a refresher. As a matter of fact, I was the one who said I loved you first. Yeah, this guy knows how to produce music. Raycon offers their wireless earbuds in a range of fun colors and patterns, with a variety of fit options to make sure it's snug in your ears. And no dangling wires or stems that bounce around or get caught on things. Their earbuds have six hours of playtime to cover your work sessions, long hikes, workouts, or whatever else. Need more? Pop them into the sleek charging case and you get 24 hours more playtime with these E25 earbuds. They have seamless Bluetooth pairing so you stay hooked up, there's a solid amount of bass for a fuller sound, and their compact design gives them a comfortable noise isolating fit. The best part is that their prices start at half of other premium audio brands. I use these to listen to podcasts and audiobooks when hitting my 10,000 steps, to get jacked up when pumping iron at the gym, and to get some vibes flowing while I script videos. They stay in, hit hard, and I really couldn't be happier with them. If I had one wish, it's that you would all check out Raycon by clicking the link in the description box, or go to buyraycon.com slash nerdexplains to get 15% off your Raycon purchase and help support the channel. Raycon has a 45-day free return policy, so why not grab a pair and check them out yourself? Alright, let's see if we can outsmart Jigsaw him and his traps. We start out following John Kramer, more infamously known as Jigsaw. He and his lovely assistant, Amanda, are setting up Lawrence and Adam's game. Their game is pretty simple. Make sure the other person dies, with the asymmetric twist that Adam was a private investigator hired to snoop on Lawrence. But Lawrence doesn't know who Adam is. It's honestly not that spicy of a relationship. Does Jigsaw really think Adam's legitimate profession is going to incite Lawrence to murder him? Come on, man. You can do better. Amanda shackles both Lawrence and Adam, places each of their instructional cassette tapes in their pockets, puts Adam in the tub along with the keys to their shackles, and then turns on the faucet. Jigsaw puts the finishing touches on his mask and pours the fake blood on the floor where he's going to act as a suicide victim holding the two primary game elements, the revolver and the cassette recorder. Jigsaw looks in the mirror and says, it's time to start our game, and then injects himself with a sedative to slow his heart rate and breathing before lying down in the blood. We don't see it here, but Jigsaw also also palmed a remote for tasers hooked up to Adam and Lawrence's shackles as a defense if they get keen. Amanda completes the setup by turning off all the lights and locking the door, sealing them all in. Before the game officially begins, we need to back up for a second. See, Lawrence and Adam aren't the only victims here. When Jigsaw was looking into the mirror saying it's time to start our game, he wasn't talking to himself. It was a two-way mirror with a camera behind it operated by Zep. Unlike Amanda, Zep isn't an assistant or apprentice. He was given a cassette tape outlining how Jigsaw had injected him with a slow-acting poison which only Jigsaw had the antidote for. If Zep wanted to live, he needed to play his part in Lawrence and Adam's game, which meant abducting Lawrence's family and killing them if Lawrence didn't kill Adam by 6pm. At the moment Jigsaw looked into the mirror and told Zep to begin, Zep was watching from off-site at Lawrence's house with his family tied up. Zep is a certified sick f who gets off on hearing the increased heart rate of his victims when he waves a gun in their face, and Zep might have been promised a position at Team Jigsaw if he pulled this off, like Amanda, who was one of the rare escapees of Jigsaw's traps. However, the amount of people who would take that offer after being poisoned and forced to abduct and kill an innocent family is slim at best. I think he has far stronger reasons to put Jigsaw down and claim the trophy for it. Zep is in a position of extreme power here. He knows who Jigsaw and his apprentice are. Jigsaw is currently incapacitated, and as we later see, Zep has the location and access to the bathroom where all this is going down. Zep can just message the details to Detective Tap and it's game over for Jigsaw and Amanda. The slow-acting poison in his system isn't a problem. John Kramer's not a toxicologist. It's not like he developed some revolutionary unheard of poison. Zep should be able to go to a hospital or poison control center and get treated if there's an antidote. The game is like 
like eight hours long, so he might as well go see if they can treat him before being forced to end an innocent family's lives. Of course, he'd have to sedate the wife and daughter while he checked so they didn't run off, because in the event the hospital staff can't treat you, well, the family's gonna have to go bye-bye so you can get that sweet antidote. Now, even if the hospital couldn't treat the poison in your blood, the antidote or at least how to make the antidote might be found in Jigsaw's home and computer hard drives. Risky, maybe, but I'd say it's less risky than trusting the asshole who poisoned you in the first place. At the very least, Zepp should be using his position behind the camera to stockpile evidence against John Kramer and Amanda that could be used to blackmail Jigsaw if his game goes sideways. Man, this makes Jigsaw look pretty stupid. He should not have chosen to victimize someone who knew him so well, and should not have given him the location of the game. Zepp doesn't consider these options, so the game begins. In Adam's panicky awakening, he unwittingly kicks the drain plug open and the key to his shackle gets sucked down the drain. Natural, probable, and very unlucky. Amanda and Jigsaw had to know that the key would likely go down the drain without Adam even realizing it was there in the first place. That's just poor game design. It's immediately clear that this is a bad situation. This isn't some state-of-the-art containment cell to house hot pickpocketer women for some handsome billionaire's pet AI project where you get to play mobile puzzle games all day and make friends with cheeky robots. You're a whiny dork chained up in a rusty basement with a bone saw next to you. The really thin silver lining is that you're still breathing. If your abductor wanted you dead, you'd already be dead. Lawrence turns on the lights, which reveals a bloody corpse in the middle of the room. To them, it looks like this corpse was another victim who committed suicide with a revolver and left his dear loved one's note on his recorder. If they took a minute to analyze the situation, they'd realize the corpse is actually very strange. Why was a man initially left in here unshackled with a loaded gun? What compelled him to supposedly kill himself? Why was his dead body and the loaded gun left here with Adam and Lawrence? Perhaps the strangest aspect of it from their POV is the crafted appearance of a supposed suicide. Any blood splatter analyst would tell you that this was no suicide. What this corpse is amateurly dolled up to look like is a standing person shooting themselves in the head, falling to the ground with a pistol and recorder in hand, and blood pooling out from the hole in their head. This didn't happen. If it did, blood and brains would have splattered onto the adjacent walls. Then, when his lifeless corpse fell, the gun and recorder would have fallen or gotten knocked out of his hands. From what I've read about suicides, yes, I went there, a victim would rarely be found holding the pistol they used on themselves because their bodies immediately go flaccid upon death. Rigor mortis only kicks in after being dead for a while. It would be extremely weird and improbable that he would have laid flat out face down on the ground before shooting himself in the head. Even if he did, the blast from that 357 Magnum Smith & Wesson Model 686 would have directionally propelled blood and brain a good distance outwards. There is some directionality to the blood, but it's jutting out on the same side he's holding the gun. The blood should be spraying in the opposite direction. You could say that I watched too much Dexter and that it's unrealistic for them to know this, but Lawrence is a surgical oncologist. He should have some general knowledge on this. All this begs the question, why dress up a corpse as a suicide victim and put it in the room with them? Hell, is this corpse even a corpse? They don't know the actual cause of death, so this man could be alive. It shouldn't be too hard to check. All they need to do is crawl as close to him as possible and check for torso expansion. If this man's alive, he'll be breathing. Even shallow breaths should be visible. They could also throw a toilet seat at him to cause a little pain as a jump starter or to get a reaction, but considering they don't know who this is and that he has a gun, I'd play my cards closer to chest and go with the former strategy. Lawrence notices that there's a brand new clock on the wall and remarks that it must have been intentionally placed there for them to tell time. Right now, it's unclear why, but what is clear is that this is not a normal abduction, at least to Lawrence. Can you see any scars? What? Huh? This is what they do, man. They kidnap you and drug you. Before you know it, you're lying in a bathtub and your kidneys are on eBay. Your foot is chained to a pipe in a derelict bathroom with a corpse in the middle of the room. I have a feeling you're gonna be wishing you woke up on ice with a kidney missing. And I highly doubt kidney thieves use eBay. Lawrence's next move is to try the door. It's low effort, so you might as well check before doing something crazy. Unsurprisingly, it doesn't budge. Even if it did, there's still the whole shackle thing to contend with. Adam finds a cassette tape in his pocket labeled play 
play me. Lawrence checks his pocket and finds one too, with the addition of a small key and a single 357 Magnum bullet. The key doesn't work on his shackle, so he tosses it to Adam, which doesn't work on his shackle either. Clearly, they're missing important information, which will be found on their tapes. They're going to need to confiscate the corpse's cassette recorder to hear how screwed they really are. Adam cleverly uses his shirt and the drain plug to retrieve the recorder and play his tape. Up until now, you've simply sat in the shadows, watching others live out their lives. So are you going to watch yourself die today, Adam? It's apparent now that his captor knows him intimately, chose him based on his flaws, and is presenting a situation that will require him to overcome them. The captor is alluding to how Adam has pathetically been a silent bystander, capturing other people's follies from the sideline with no skin in the game. I mean, a private investigator is a legitimate career that has constructive utility. It's not like Adam was one of those assholes who videos people drowning in floodwaters to get 15 minutes of e-fame instead of trying to help. I guess you can't expect someone who designs torture dungeons to have a strong moral code. Adam's game is weird because you'd think that based on his targeted character flaw, he would be instructed to sacrifice himself in some way in order to help Lawrence survive, but nope. All he gets is watch yourself die or do something about it. Not wanting to risk breaking the recorder by throwing it to Lawrence, he tells Lawrence to just throw him the tape. What would happen if they accidentally broke the recorder, or Lawrence beefed his toss and it went down the bath drain too? Would Jigsaw get up, sigh in disappointment, and just headshot both of them for being morons? I'd like to think so. Adam pops Lawrence's tape in and hits play. Dr. Gordon, this is your wake-up call. Every day of your working life, you have given people the news that they're gonna die soon. Now you will be the cause of death. Your aim in this game is to kill Adam. You have until six on the clock to do it. If you do not kill Adam by six, then Allison and Diana will die. Well, there's your reason for the brand new clock. You have eight hours to kill Adam or your family is murdered and you're left here to decompose. It's a good thing Adam's key went down the drain. If he had initially helped unshackle Lawrence, Lawrence would easily be able to grab the gun, shoot Adam and win the game. Both Adam and Lawrence's strategies for winning the game and surviving are antagonistic to one another. Jigsaw was pretty explicit. Adam needs to prevent Lawrence from killing him before 6 p.m. and Lawrence needs to kill Adam by 6 p.m. I don't see any out of the box way of beating this so following the instructions on the tape is the only real option. Adam should feign helping Lawrence find a way out of here, but refrain from actually helping him in any manner because ultimately it will come down to Lawrence using whatever he has to kill Adam and save his family. Likewise, Lawrence needs to feign that he's empathetic and has no interest in killing Adam in order to recruit his help solving the clues. Like the follow your heart, Jigsaw softly muttered on the tape. This one wasn't too hard, as there's a toilet with a big heart on it written in feces. Adam digs his hand around the shit-filled bowl and comes up empty and brown-handed before realizing that he should have checked the top compartment first. In it, there's a bag with two hand saws and then incriminating photos Adam took of Lawrence's affair. Adam neglects to share those with Lawrence. No need to stir conflict or give Lawrence any more information that he could use against you. Adam pulls the saws out and tosses Lawrence the spare. Shouldn't have done that. You know that saw isn't cutting through those shackles or padlocks. You know the corpse in the middle has a gun which Lawrence has the bullet for. And you know Lawrence's sole mission is to kill you. When that clock starts ticking down to 6 p.m., he will use that saw on his foot, grab the gun, and kill you to save his own ass and family. Maybe you don't want to overtly be antagonistic to Lawrence, in which case you could just try the saw on your own shackle and demonstrate how it won't help them and that he doesn't need one. You could try to saw through the rusty pipe the shackles are tied around, but with how old and shitty those saws are, I don't think that would work at all. They both give up on sawing through the shackles and Lawrence tells Adam that he thinks he knows who their captor is. He says that months ago he was a suspect in the Jigsaw case which we're going to flash back to. In the flashback, the police are investigating the shredded remains of Jigsaw's latest victim. He also had a cassette tape on him outlining the rules for the game. Hello Paul, you are a perfectly healthy, sane, middle class male, but if you want to live, You'll have to cut yourself again. Find the path through the razor wire to the door. This big fella panic dove belly first into the razor wire and started flailing around when he got stuck. The flailing caused the razors to rip deep into his flesh, so deep that his stomach acid was found on the ground. Within minutes, he was dead from blood loss. <laughs>
The best way to beat this trap is to do the opposite of what he did and go low and slow. It's hard to tell how big the cage maze is, but it doesn't seem that big and with two hours, he should have enough time to slowly navigate them. By getting low, he removes an entire attack surface he could get cut from. I'm not sure whether you'd want to crawl face up or face down. Even though crawling face down mitigates exposure to your most vulnerable areas like your neck artery, stomach, and groin, you're going to get caught up with razor sinking into your back and it'll be very difficult to pull them out with your hands. With how slow you can go, I'd be inclined to go face up shoulder crawling and using my hands to relocate the razor wires out and around my body as best as possible. Doing nothing isn't an option. I'm sure his family will report him missing, but it's highly unlikely the police will find him within the 7 to 10 days it will take for him to die of dehydration. I don't think the police will have many leads to go off of in this case. Jigsaw probably just read this guy's suicide attempt in the news and threw him into an unmarked van before placing him in this trap. Lawrence interrupts the flashback with a stupid monologue saying that Jigsaw wasn't really a murderer, that technically he never killed anyone, that he found ways for people to kill themselves. Uh, I'm pretty sure you'd still be tried as a murderer. Judge, I only stripped them down naked and prisoned them in an underground maze of razor wire under a time constraint which they will need to reach the exit by or it'll be sealed off and they'll be left to starve to death. They basically killed themselves by choice. The next crime scene the police show up to is that of a charred corpse in a room of glass with a vault in the middle and red numbers painted all over the walls. He too has a cassette tape. Hello Mark, if you're so sick, then why do I have so many photos of you up and about? Let's put your so-called illness to the test. So this guy was murdered for playing hooky? Oh, sorry, I mean, so because this guy played hooky, he was lawfully relocated into a situation which happened to be potentially dangerous in which he somehow found a way to kill himself? That's one of the lamest reasons for killing someone I've heard. Literally everyone has done this at least once in their lives. Maybe this poor guy needed a mental health day and his employer was a raging dick. How did Jigsaw even find this guy? Did he explicitly go out looking for someone who called in sick too much? What is too much? Because like we said, everyone's done this from time to time. Did Jigsaw just follow a guy who was out walking in the park during the workday and see if he was calling in sick? Or did he get a job somewhere just to find someone who called in sick too much? What the f*** is Jigsaw doing? There is absolutely zero shortage of criminals and downright horrible people walking free. Why not choose them? Like the man in the razor wire, this guy panicked, started frantically running around with a candle, and caught the tip of the flame. The best way to beat this trap is, again, taking your time, methodically trying each combination in order so you don't repeat or miss a combination. Most slow-acting poisons will give you hours if not days before you succumb to them. You should have plenty of time. The room seems well lit enough to where you don't need to wave the candle in front of your face in order to see the numbers. Using the candle just unnecessarily risks combustion of the flammable ectoplasmic goo you're covered in. The glass on the floor shouldn't be a problem either considering you have shoes on. The most difficult aspect of this trap is the vault itself. We have no idea if it's a three or four combination lock, so the possible combinations we need to try just doubled. Not only that, but if you aren't familiar with these combination locks, you won't know how to clear the combination, which direction you need to turn the dial for each combination number, and how many times to pass each combination number before stopping on it. I mean, shit. I didn't realize they were this complicated until I looked into it. Since the vault is only carrying an antidote and shouldn't be too heavy, I might opt to cradle it and use it as a battering ram against the brick wall. Most brick walls, especially old ones like in this room, will start to crumble under repeated assault. It takes some time, but not more than trying a thousand combinations, which may or may not work. It's more of a sure bet in my opinion. Jigsaw might have had a loose connection with the razor wire guy, but Mr. Hookie is a different story. In order to know that this guy was calling in sick all the time, Jigsaw would have either had to be working with him or had access to his cell phone records where he could find out that this guy was calling in sick and not just taking PTO. The police should be cross-checking everyone at his work and his recent personal life and who had records or phone taps on him. The biggest breakthrough, almost suspiciously so, is the pen light Jigsaw supposedly left behind. They run the prints and find the pen light's owner, which is none other than Dr. Lawrence Gordon. Lawrence was working on John Kramer's brain tumor situation when the police arrived and questioned him about how his pen light ended up at a murder scene. He gives them his alibi of going to a seedy motel to have an affair with a med student that night, which checks out. An alibi could be faked pretty easily, especially for a mastermind such as 
Jigsaw. But if Lawrence wasn't Jigsaw, then whoever Jigsaw is or worked with visited this hospital in order to grab the pen light. The police should be investigating anyone who might have come into contact with Lawrence. Janitors, doctors, patients, orderlies, everyone. As well as the camera footage looking for any suspicious behavior or anyone swiping Lawrence's gear. Since we know that Jigsaw always has a relatively deep connection with his targets, it would likely be an employee or frequent patient. The detectives should run the audio of the previous victim's tapes past Lawrence to see if he recognized the voice and can make a connection. While the voice masker was applied, it's not done sufficiently enough to separate the man from the voice. Find the path through the razor wire to the door. I'm pretty confident Lawrence could identify this as John Kramer, and the ensuing investigations would have uncovered his side hustle. After much deliberation, I can't think of any rational reason for Jigsaw framing Lawrence, bringing a ton of police attention to him, and then using him as a victim in his next trap. This was a high-risk, low-reward move that provided the police with leads they could follow back to him. I get that Jigsaw is not overly concerned with discretion as he leaves his victims' mangled corpses in the traps for the police to find, and uses his Jigsaw call card to gain notoriety and spread his twisted social justice message as far as possible, but this poor frame job easily could have ended his career. Calling card or not, the most successful serial killers target completely random people they haven't established any connection with. The police ask Lawrence to listen to the testimony of a woman named Amanda that had escaped a trap Jigsaw put her in to see if it jogs his memory about the pen light and to gauge his reaction to seeing the victim. Amanda starts telling her story of waking up with a metal contraption on her head and Jigsaw breaking the bad news. He tells her that the device is hooked into her upper and lower jaws, and when the timer at the back goes off, her mouth will be permanently ripped open, like a reverse bear trap. He's nice enough to give a demonstration. <laughs> He then goes on to say that there's one key to unlock the device, but it's in the stomach of her dead cellmate. Amanda, as all do, and justifiably so, panics, tries to rip her restraints off and take the reverse bear trap off her head. Getting up pulled a pin on the jawbreaker and initiated the countdown. There really was no way to know that that would happen or prevent it. Even if she did try to turn around and assess her situation calmly, the wire was short enough that it would have pulled regardless. Jigsaw never told her how much time she had, but the ticking sound every second would strongly suggest to her that she has less than 60 seconds to grab the knife and start digging through the corpse for the key. Only the dead man isn't dead. Amanda doesn't have a choice here. She's seconds away from getting her head cracked wide open. It's do or die, you or him. The aggressive fist stabs are not the way to go with the scalpel. She's just causing excessive hemorrhaging and mashing up the guts into an unrecognizable mess. She needs to create a large circular incision to remove a layer of skin over the top right of his upper abdomen so she can actually identify and locate the stomach. And that is important. The stomach is in the upper right area of your abdomen, right around your lower ribs. Not your belly, that's where your intestines are. If you fuck that up, you just died. Once the stomach is located, she just needs to create another incision to open it up and snag the key to unlock the headpiece and throw it off. The police tell Lawrence that even though Jigsaw said that the man with the key in his stomach was dead, and even though Jigsaw said he wasn't lying, the man was alive just doped up on enough opiates to where he couldn't move or feel anything. It's fucked up, but it could have been a lot worse for the both of them. He could have been strapped to a chair completely sober. He got to go out feeling calm, relaxed, and in a state of euphoria. We never hear why this guy was murdered by Jigsaw. He never had a chance at survival, which seems really unfair and unsportsmanlike. The police also mention that Amanda was a drug addict before all this, and maybe that's why she was chosen. Yeah, it's kind of a mystery because this trap didn't exhibit the previous theme of overcoming personal flaws. It was almost like he came up with this cool head contraption and wanted to find any excuse to put it on someone for his twisted amusement. Okay, maybe it was more of a choose life thing and the drugged man was a representation of her on drugs, but it's still ridiculous. The lifelong PTSD caused by this is not going to improve her drug addiction whatsoever. Why am I even still on this? Jigsaw's clearly not in the business of rehabilitation. Sure, Amanda said Jigsaw helped her, but we all know that's not true. I mean the sheer fact that she said killing someone and almost 
almost getting her jaw removed from her head helped her is evidence that it didn't help her. Quite the opposite. In fact, if I was the detective, I'd be trailing this broad. From Tep's perspective, her Stockholm Syndrome, coupled with a psycho-like Jigsaw's infatuation with his victims, especially the rare ones that escape, means there's a chance she will lead them to him. We know from the beginning that Amanda was helping Jigsaw set the game up, so realistically, trailing her could very well have led them to Jigsaw. The important piece of information that Lawrence can use from this trip down memory lane is that it's possible to be free if you win the game, even though Jigsaw lied about some aspects of the game. Adam then picks up a piece of glass and realizes it's actually a two-way mirror, so he chucks a bunch of scrap at the bathroom mirror and breaks it, which uncovers the hidden camera recording them. Why even hide the camera in the first place, if by design the victims know it's a game? and they're being watched to see if they achieve their goals. And if you were going to hide a camera for whatever reason, why would you leave extra fragments of two-way mirror glass on the ground? With the clock ticking down, Lawrence realizes he needs to start playing the game or bad shit's gonna happen to him and his family. He remembers that Jigsaw mentioned in the tape that there are numerous ways for him to win and that X marks the spot for the treasure. He asks Adam to help him find the X under the context of it being beneficial to them both finding a way out of here. Remember, this is the last man standing game with no successful cooperative strategy Strategy. Adam should know that he would literally be helping Lawrence obtain a way to kill him. How can you be the calm doctor guy when your wife and kid are out there? He's got them too. He could be doing anything to them right now. Are you thinking about that? I oh. am thinking about that. Adam comes across as impulsive and naive, so I don't think this was a calculated move. It was a great move though, because it distracted Lawrence into spending precious time reminiscing about his family instead of making progress, without seeming too obvious that Adam's trying to stall him. In his flashback to the night of his abduction, he was working late when his daughter came to him scared of a bad man in her closet. I know kids have overactive imaginations, and it's probably nothing, but I'd be grabbing the 9mm from the nightstand. Lawrence doesn't even check the closet, he just tells her a bedtime story story before getting paged for an emergency. He neglects to check his wallet for clues, even though every possession was included for a reason, and passes it to Adam to show him pictures of his wife and daughter. Only the picture of his wife was replaced with a picture of his family captive, with a note on the back reading, X marks the spot. Sometimes you see more with your eyes shut. Instead of telling Lawrence, he just says it's not here and throws the wallet back to him. Maybe Adam is more devious than he appears. This was another solid move that took a clue out of Lawrence's hands without being obvious about it. We get some more backstory on the night Lawrence was abducted. After he left, his family was subdued and tied up by a man in the closet that Lawrence didn't check. If only Lawrence was paranoid and armed, actually checked the closet, and gunned down Zepp. Now his family is tied up with Zepp getting off to their increased heart rate when he waves a pistol in their face. Zepp then parts the curtains and shoves his face up to the window to, I guess, check if anyone called the cops? He does have a reason to be paranoid. Lawrence was under investigation after Jigsaw framed him with a pen light he stole, but for that same reason, bare facing the window the police are possibly watching is a bad idea. Detective Tapp was staking out Lawrence and was able to snap a picture of Zepp peeping his head out. It was a bad photo when maybe he couldn't identify the person with it alone, but Tapp can use this opportunity to tail him when he leaves, or confront Lawrence with this evidence as well as cross-check it with anyone Lawrence had frequent contact with at the hospital. The frame job was five months ago, so why is Tapp so unrelenting in staking out Lawrence's house? Did he literally get nothing from looking at the connection between Jigsaw and the hospital, or did he just not check in tunnel vision? on the target of the obvious frame job. Yeah, probably the latter. Looks like we're gonna find out in this flashback inside a flashback to just after Tap questioned Lawrence and dropped him off at home. Later that night when Tap was reviewing the tapes, he recognized a gang sign on the wall and heard a fire alarm in the background of the tape. By cross-checking the gang sign location with what fire department responded to an emergency that night, they were able to locate an old mannequin factory which they believed is where Jigsaw's operation was. Anxious to bag Jigsaw, these wannabe action heroes load up and bust down the front door without any information, planning, or backup. Hastily rolling on a guy that's known for making traps isn't the smartest idea. Instead of breaking in right off the bat, maybe stake it out first. Tail whoever comes and goes, get their license plate, visual profile, home address, and get a proper warrant. Then, once Jigsaw enters the building, you can send in SWAT teams who are vastly better trained and equipped to bag someone like this. Inside the factory, there are dioramas of traps and a man locked up in between two drill bits. This this is Jigsaw's operation, alright. Someone starts coming up the elevator, so they hide to try to ambush 
ambush him, tap and sink at the drop on Jigsaw, but all of a sudden become good cops that want to do things the right way. They broke in without a warrant at night, Tap's hungry for vengeance, this dude is clearly the bad guy. It's not unreasonable for them in their position to shoot first and ask questions later, especially since Jigsaw is the slippery mastermind and you're on his turf. At least kneecap him. Great, now Jigsaw triggered the trap and this poor guy is gonna get Frankensteined in under 30 seconds. Tap has every possible right to blast this guy right here, right now. As for the victim, Singh doesn't need to find the keys, he just needs to find the power cable and shoot it, or just shoot the padlock off. Tap really needs to get some distance between him and Jigsaw so this doesn't end in a tug of war for the gun. I'm sick of it all. Damn it, Tap, all you had to do was keep him at arm's length or put a hole in his pelvis. Now Jigsaw's getting away and you're on the ground with your throat slit. Singh runs after Jigsaw and fires some buckshot into his back. It looks like a kill shot, but at this point, I'd pump a few more shots off into his corpse to confirm the kill. Don't want him scurrying away or flipping around with a gun. Again, there is every reason to suspect that a mastermind who designs human traps for a living will have trapped his own operation in case he was compromised like this. Singh tunnel visions on the hooded man and accidentally trips one of them. Tap tries to help, but only gets there in time to see Singh's headless body and Jigsaw getting away. This would explain his unrelenting desire to track down Jigsaw and why he was taken off the force, but it doesn't explain why he's tracking Lawrence so aggressively. The hooded man's voice and figure simply don't match up. I also have a hard time believing that the ensuing police raid didn't yield any usable evidence. All these flashbacks cost Lawrence a lot of time. He now just has over two hours remaining to kill Adam. Better start looking for that X unless you want to lose a leg. Adam, remembering what the picture said, comes up with the idea to turn the lights off, which reveals a glow-in-the-dark painted X that was charged by the lights being on. Behind the X, there's a box. It's padlocked, so Adam tosses the key back to Lawrence so he can open it. Adam, why are you helping Lawrence? He has to kill you or him and his family die, remember? The box contains a note, cell phone, lighter, and cigarette. Lawrence secretly reads the note, which says, the cigarettes are harmless, I promise. Smoking is only poisonous when it ends in bloodshed. Think about this. You don't need a gun to kill Adam. Adam foolishly wants to smoke the cigarette, regardless of the fact that it's a blatantly horrible decision. This method of Lawrence winning the game was obviously devised to play on Adam's cigarette addiction. The phone wasn't mentioned in the note though. Lawrence tries calling 911 with it, but the phone was altered to only be able to receive calls, not make them. The tampered phone somehow rings the bell for Lawrence and sparks another flashback to the night he was abducted. He was finishing up at the hospital and walking back to his car when he got the feeling someone was watching him. That feeling was triggered by Adam moronically leaving the flash on in a dark parking lot while snapping ninja pictures of Lawrence. Lawrence hops in to his beamer and tries to make a phone call. His cell doesn't work, so he stops to try the payphone, which doesn't work either. While he's distracted, someone in a pig mask sneaks out of his car and runs up on him. Why didn't the pig man piano wire his neck while he was in the car? Abducting someone out in the open without a quick getaway is much riskier. Just saying. I still don't get the backseat abduction though. If your target has half a brain or decent peripherals, they're gonna be checking the backseat before getting in and they will see you. Especially if you're a dumbass wearing a pig mask and a red suit. I can just see Jigsaw tucked into the backseat trying to scrunch in low, hearing a knock on the window and wondering if Lawrence saw him or just accidentally hit the window. He slowly turns around and sees Lawrence with a pistol waving for him to step out of his vehicle. After wasting more time storytelling, Lawrence asks Adam how he knew to turn the lights off. Adam hesitates to answer at first, but eventually gives in and hands over the picture of his captive wife and daughter with a note on the back. Good going, Adam. You just provided massive motivation for Lawrence to kill you. Yes, Lawrence already heard on the cassette tape that his family was in jeopardy, but it wasn't as real until now. Lawrence remembers the tape, which said that the man in the middle had poison in his blood, and the note from the box, which said that six Cigarettes are only deadly when they end in bloodshed. Putting two and two together, he secretly dabs the cigarette that Adam was desperate to smoke in the corpse's poison-filled blood. Great! Lawrence doesn't need to chop his foot off to get the gun to kill Adam with. He can just toss the cig and lighter over to Adam, watch him slowly die, win the game, and save him and his family. From the flashbacks, he knows that this will end badly for him if he doesn't win, and that winning
winning is an option. Instead of playing his hand, he sacrifices it by flipping the lights off and secretly telling Adam all about the death sticks and the charades planning. Lawrence's plan is to have Adam fake smoke the poison cigarette and fake die so Lawrence can fake win, and when their captor comes in to free Lawrence, they can kill him and then ride off into the sunset on their ivory stallions. This is a massively flawed plan. If your captor has a decent microphone or a camera with night mode, he will hear and see every detail. Even if he's using a shitty camera and mic, which he stupidly is, you still don't know what type of poison was put in the blood, nor what its effects are and how long these effects will take to kick in. Without knowing what type of poison was used, Adam couldn't possibly sell the fake death, and you can be sure Adam's gonna do a horrible job acting this whole thing out anyways. Lawrence flips the lights back on and starts the show. If I was Adam, I still wouldn't trust Lawrence. He didn't have to tell you about the poison, so he's probably being honest, but you could fake smoke it instead of taking a full drag on it. Adam's faking is ridiculous. Nobody's buying that shit. Jigsaw uses his taser remote to shock Adam so Zepp can see that Lawrence didn't actually win his game yet. Should have given him the actual poison. The shock jolted Adam's memory about his abduction, or so he says. I think he's just reverting to stalling Lawrence because his plan failed and now he's gonna have to try to kill Adam. Adam starts telling the story of how he woke up in his dark room with the power out, then heard some strange noises in his living room which he went to check out. <laughs> Really, Jigsaw? You put your doll on his couch with a Halloween noisemaker? Why? You didn't even use that as a distraction to nap him from behind. Adam hears someone making noise in the closet and grabs a bat to check it out. If I was Adam, I'd be leaving my apartment right now and calling the cops. Why would you, a weak, unarmed, untrained person, willingly engage in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with an intruder? It's not gonna end well for you. <laughs> Adam's not the only idiot here. Hiding in someone's closet and making a bunch of noise to bait them to open said closet is a terrible way to abduct someone. You have no escape route if things go south. Like if the other person brought friends over, they had a knife or gun, or they called the cops and waited outside the apartment. By the time Adam wraps his story up, Lawrence has 23 minutes left on the clock. He doesn't seem motivated to start hacking away at his foot yet. No matter, part of Zepp's instructions was to call Lawrence and have his wife and daughter give him some motivation. His daughter tells him a man has them tied up with a gun, and his wife tells him not to believe Adam's lies, that Adam knows him. Lawrence wastes more time confronting Adam about his lies. Does it even matter what Adam has to say? You know what you need to do. Adam should just be honest about being hired to tail Lawrence as a private investigator. Sure, it'll piss Lawrence off, but it doesn't give him any more reason to kill you than he already has. It actually helps Adam by wasting more of Lawrence's time. Adam flicks the pictures he took of Lawrence's affair at him and says he was stalking Lawrence the night he was abducted, but had left when Lawrence got in his car so he didn't see who abducted him. Lawrence questions Adam about who hired him, thinking that must be the person who put them in here. Adam says that he was hired by a tall black man with a scar on his neck. Lawrence immediately figures that this was Agent Tap. Tap must have hired Adam because Lawrence had a restraining order on him and couldn't get close. After their fight, Adam double takes one of his pictures, realizing there's a face in it. You just now remember that you took a picture of some random guy at Lawrence's house the night you were both abducted? He throws it to Lawrence, who identifies the man as Zepp, the orderly from the hospital. Why was this picture of Zepp at Lawrence's house placed in the bathroom? Now Lawrence and Adam both know who Zepp is. If either of them win and get free, they will report report Zepp to the police, who will report John Kramer to the police. Zepp is in a game he can't win. He either dies from poisoning or gets thrown in the slammer. Zepp could choose to complete the game, get the antidote, and flee to a non-extradition country, or he could immediately report Jigsaw to the police and check himself into a hospital. When Zepp isn't looking, Lawrence's wife slips her restraints and patiently waits for her moment to strike. Lawrence fails to kill Adam and is now officially out of time. He knows from the previous Jigsaw cases that Jigsaw doesn't fuck around. His family will be executed and he will be left here to rot. Zepp draws his 1911 and then gives Lawrence one last call so he can hear his wife telling him he failed before she catches a bullet in her teeth. Jigsaw, you sadistic son of a bitch. The call is a nice touch, but telegraphing your blatant intention to kill the wife and daughter in front of their faces like this is just going to incite a ferocious last stand. It's better for you if they don't see it coming. His other mistake was leaving them in a room by themselves with poorly tied rope restraints. If you're gonna do that, at least check the restraints every time you re-enter the room to make sure they didn't slip them. Lawrence gets the call, Allison tells him that he failed, but right before Zepp domes her, she 
snatches his gun from him. Unfortunately, she lacks the nerve to kill and makes the all too common mistake of getting within arm's reach, which gives Zeb the opportunity to grab for the gun back. <laughs> Good thing Tap heard the shots because Allison's losing control over the gun. In a last ditch move, she shanks his leg with a pair of hair clippers. Why the hell does everyone always go for the leg? The same thing happened in my last video on the Hills Have Eyes. And look how well that worked out for Lynn. People, you need to go for the throat. Instead of capitalizing on Zep being stunned, she runs for her daughter. Allison, you need to stomp out Zep when he's down. Priorities. Your daughter being freed won't help you if Zeb gets up and guns you both down. Lucky for her, Tap comes in guns hot before Zeb can finish the job. Tap runs out of ammo and tackles Zeb to the ground. Zeb stuns Tap with a flower vase to the head and runs after Allison and her daughter. Why is nobody seizing the kill when they have the chance? It would take two seconds to put one in Tap's chest before running after the family. Zeb can't find Allison and her daughter, so he runs back to the warehouse to kill Lawrence. His plan is really falling apart here. I don't think he's going to be getting that antidote anymore. More. Tap tracks Zeb to the warehouse in the most legit car chase I've ever seen. They get into a scuffle, which ends with Zeb shooting Tap in the chest. Allison and her daughter safely emerge from their hiding spot, but the problem is that all Lawrence heard on the phone was gunshots and screaming. For all he knows, they got mowed down. He breaks down crying and gets electrocuted until he foams at the mouth. Why was he electrocuted? I get shocking at him for fake dying, but this seemed unnecessary. Allison calls back on the phone to tell them that they were safe, but it's just out of reach because when Lawrence was electrocuted, the phone got knocked out of his hand. He could flip the box around to give him a little bit more reach so we could snag the phone, but just gives up trying to retrieve it. Lawrence giving up on getting the phone leads to him freaking out and irrationally deciding to cut his leg off so he could shoot at him and attempt to salvage his game. <laughs> a little late on that, Chief. If Lawrence had gotten the phone, here how his family was safe would have prevented this freakout. Before sawing his leg off at the ankle, he tries to apply a makeshift tourniquet with his shirt. If you've seen my other videos, you know his execution is terrible. He basically over-unders his blouse and pulls it slightly tight like it's a fucking shoelace. And this guy's supposed to be a surgeon. There is no way this adequately cut off blood circulation. He finishes sawing his foot off, grabs the revolver, puts a round in the chamber, and takes a shot at Adam from across the room. If you were Lawrence, you'd want to get his close as possible before firing. Most people will have trouble hitting a human-sized target from seven yards away. Zepp arrives and tries to kill Lawrence, but Adam sweeps his leg and bashes his brains in with a toilet cover. <laughs> I'm surprised Adam had it in him. Nice job. With the door wide open and Lawrence free from his shackle, he tells Adam he's going to leave and get help. Adam checks Zepp's clothing to see if he had a key to his shackle and finds another cassette player which reveals how Zepp was not only their captor, but another victim in the same game. Slow acting poison coursing through your system, which only I have the antidote. Listen carefully if you will. There are rules. The big twist moment hits when the corpse dressed as a suicide victim in the middle of the room gets up and reveals himself to be Jigsaw. Realizing your captor was right in front of you this whole time has to be a bitch of a revelation. In the beginning, I laid out how this corpse might not have been dead and that they should check it if they get the chance. However, I don't think this would have helped. They had no way of knowing that this was Jigsaw and no way of attacking him. Even if they had gotten free, threatening and attacking Jigsaw would have just resulted in them getting electrocuted to death. When Jigsaw fully wakes up, he tells Adam that the key to his shackle was in the bathtub. Yeah, it actually went down the drain. If you wanted the key to serve a purpose, you should have hidden it somewhere else with clues to it. It seems like he was trying to tell Adam how to free himself because technically he won the game. Adam's understandably pretty pissed off right now and tries to kill Jigsaw with Zepp's pistol, but Jigsaw tasers him before he can get the shot off. Ah! Game over! Ah! Adam trying to kill Jigsaw may have changed his mind on letting Adam live. But what was Jigsaw expecting? That Adam was going to be grateful and cordial? Later in the sequels, we find out that Amanda was having nightmares about Adam. 
and had gone back into the bathroom to put him out of his misery by suffocating him with a plastic bag. Not much mercy for a man who technically won the game. What makes Adam's death even more f***ed up is that after Jigsaw left Adam to die, he found Lawrence passed out in the hallway from his attempt to cauterize his leg on a steam pipe. And instead of finishing Lawrence off for losing the game, he allows Lawrence to live, fits him with a prosthetic foot, and later brings him on as an apprentice at Team Jigsaw. Then again, you can't really expect a serial killer to be honest and fair with you. Let's recap the pivotal moments where a different decision could have altered who lived or died. In my opinion, Zepp had the motive and the means to single-handedly take down Jigsaw and Amanda. This would have saved Adam's life and ensured that Lawrence didn't end up working for Jigsaw in the future. Jigsaw left a ton of leads which the detective should have been able to use to track him down. His voice on the cassettes, Amanda's testimony, the pen light, etc. Ultimately they did, but hesitated to pull the trigger once they caught him. Singh's death, as well as the pain and suffering of all of Jigsaw's future victims enabled by Tap's pathetic failure, is mind-blowing. Razor Wire Guy and Hooky Guy both might have been able to escape their traps had they calmed down and thought things through a bit before bum-rushing the traps. All said and done, I think we could have beaten the traps from saw with less life and limb lost. Thanks for watching, and remember, actually, I don't really have anything for this. If you find yourself in one of these situations, you're probably f***ed. Peace.